All right. Now that we can hear me, I'm right about to sneeze. I couldn't have done that before. We are getting ready for our last talk of the day, but, but it is not the last talk of our CDC because we are going to be back tomorrow and we're going to be back the day after that. And goodness, if it doesn't even feel like we're going to be back the day after that for some of us, uh, taking down this thing, we don't get to celebrate new years. This is our new year's. For others, you guys get to go home and have great lives, and lucky, good to be you. I'm very fascinated. So we've got Deanna coming up here. She's going to be talking with us about building actual alternatives. She's going to cover every alternative ever in history. So this is, this is going to be a fascinating talk. It's going to be a bit long. We've allocated the rest of our time here at C3 for this talk. Uh, I hope you guys don't plan to sleep. Deanna, please tell us um, the alternatives of things. Thanks, Diego. Hello, everybody. Thank you for braving the last uh, talk at CDC tonight. Um, I will make it short and sweet and do it uh, just to kind of take you on a nice little narrative and a journey. Um, and from there, we can decide if we want to talk about it after. I'll leave some time for questions, or we can go have some drinks and, and get on with the, the evening. So. I essentially want to, I'm not going to do any slides, I'm just going to just talk a little bit about building a counter narrative to, to what we're trying to do, generally speaking, within kind of decentralized technology, zero knowledge proofs, within the entire narrative of, of pro-privacy development and privacy technology in general. And I am going to just essentially give my observations and some some general postulations that I have as I've been witnessing as a newcomer to the Monero community, but also just someone that's been observing for the last little while and, and seeing this community firsthand. So I felt, um, felt I would do that. So who am I? A bit about myself and uh, why am I up here even doing this in the first place. I am academically trained as a global political economist. So I studied, uh, I study a lot of policies. I'm a governance scholar. Global governance is my jam. I love looking into the different ways and mechanisms in which we uh, negotiate how to apply and use technology. So specifically, techno-scientific governance. I focused on AI and I was drawn into the whole blockchain space and the crypto space in general when I started seeing this kind of ad hoc um, formulation of different types of communities all over the world coming together and negotiating for themselves the the ways in which we would, for example, um, deal in finance and in our currencies or how we would uh, determine what consensus is. So I was really drawn to this space. Um, and all the while I've been working in industry for a long time in really, really old, archaic industries that are adverse to change. And I've been applying and scaling technology for for several years in terms of uh, renewable energies or protein separation. Um, most recently, I've been working on um, applying blockchain in the real world setting because there was very, very little real world blockchain and I just in general didn't know if I trusted the technology or if it could even be applied. So we've um, combined synthetic DNA and blockchain to trace bunker fuels, which is ship fuels for a new environmental regulation that's finally coming into the shipping sector for sulfur. So I work within compliance, but specifically within environmental compliance. Um, and I think blockchain for traceability is a great tool there. So I've been um, kind of in and around this, the blockchain sector and in the tech sector for a long time. I've been working with industries that do not like change and having to communicate change and create change is a big, uh, a big part of what I do. And in addition to that, I've seen a lot of the comings and goings within this space and I have a lot of uh, kind of opinions in this area as well. So that's what I'll share with you today. So generally speaking, um, I'm going to draw from a lot of influences as well. I think we've heard it referenced quite a lot, but the seminal piece or the Bible I would refer to of our digital age or of this of our age this year, uh, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism by Shoshana Zuboff, I think is a great, great um, piece and book on, on privacy, on the future trajectory of our technologies, on on how we're gonna go forward within the financial um, financial privacy context as well. And I'll draw tandems to that and to the Monero community. I'm also very um, influenced by a lot of critical technologists as well, discussions on freedom in the philosophical realm. So I'll bring a lot of these into play. 
And um, I think to ground it at the beginning, it'd be good to just, I, it's been happening on this stage a lot. I've seen it quite a lot throughout the, the conference as well, but surveillance capitalism is a term that we're starting to use quite often. And I think it's a very important place to start. So what is surveillance capitalism? Why does it matter? You know, why is it something that we need to even be concerned with? Um, so that essentially uh, is, you know, the, mi the mining of our behavioral data. The, our, our experiences as humans is now extending to the digital realm. Our rights have not yet extended to the digital realm as well, but the mining of our behavioral experiences and our, our human data has been taken into a capitalist model. Um, profit from major, the five major companies, the biggest companies we've ever seen in history. Concentrated power and wealth have now been utilizing our experiences as humans and monetizing it. Does that necessarily matter? Is that something we should be concerned about? A lot of people aren't. Uh, that's the narrative that I'm going to be bringing forward, and it's the counter narrative that I'm really interested in. So I think in respect to surveillance capitalism and why that matters, um, when it comes to our, for example, our private financial information that we've always had um, within the centralized authorities of banks that we're now inviting you know the kind of deconstruction you know how do we break down banks how do we not have the third party intermediaries how do we build trust within in consensus within our you know ourselves and our technologies that allow us to to transact with each other these are all great questions but in doing so we're also asking questions about our own financial privacy and how we are going to be building the technology of the future that allows us to be able to either put them put that in the hands of corporations or put that in the hands of surveillance capitalism models or allows us to negotiate how we want to essentially move forward with this so when it comes to I think how, how technology has been, the trajectory that we've been on thus far and how we built it has been basically building the glass house model. So we have been building and, and deploying technologies for a long time uh, in the sense of being users in the system that are essentially used. We have given up our data and done so in a way that we have gained back. We have gotten you know, whatever service that we deem necessary or that we think that is important to have. But what I think is really crucial here, and now what I'm going to bring it concretely towards, is that we are moving into an age where we now need to define for ourselves, as those building these systems, as those that are going to be utilizing these systems in the future, what it is that is really important to us. And I think this is something that I've personally come to um, really admire within the Monero community and within what has been built thus far, within how it's being built, and the conscious design choices that are being made by those that are developing and deploying this technology and those that are utilizing it as well. So I think this is something that um, we really need to discuss because what we're facing right now when it comes to the, you know, the way in which we are now using, using technology or, or how we are going forward is that we have, we have lost our right to be able to make decisions as autonomous people. We are also starting to lose our self and the self is very important. Because when it comes down to it, that's what we really have. And if we're moving into this digital world, into the next you know, generation of technology, into the next era of evolution, essentially, as human beings, we need to start talking about what it means to have a self and what it means to be able to transact with one each, other, each other on any level. And I think there's something that's really fundamental about blockchain that, to me, had been what drove me to it in the beginning that is, has in many respects fallen apart. Um, and that is essentially that we decided, you know, there's this amazing movement that had happened within, I say the tech realm, of course, but it happened as, as well with this challenging of the notion of central authorities, of the concentrated power and wealth that is, that is accumulated. You know, the financial crisis created a lot of these, these disruptions and these disillusionments. But then what happened is we said, okay, we're banding together, we're creating this new technology, we can define this for ourselves, we'll utilize this in the ways that we want to be using them. We won't need third party intermediaries or we don't need people telling us what to do. And essentially what I've found throughout these years and what I've seen firsthand is that you know, a lot of these, these heroes or these people that we believed in and ultimately have, have got rich quick. They've found ways in which you know, they've satisfied whatever it is that they're working on or they furthermore have have been derailed or had a lot of mission creep and I think ultimately now what we have found ourselves at the risk of is we've built transparent public ledgers which we haven't necessarily questioned how we're utilizing them what did you know 
technology is not, does not have politics inherently. Artifacts don't have politics. But what we have been seeing is that there's either narratives that are being spun to dis discourage us from utilizing these technologies because they're not in the hands of those that have the power now. And secondly, there's also the, uh, the counter narrative that we're also faced with right now, which is that um, you know, the alternative that everybody was essentially building um, has fallen short. And I think that's just maybe my personal opinion about this space, but I think in many respects, what I was excited about is that we're actually building something that's going to matter. We're going to be building something that we'll be able to, to negotiate on our own terms, how we utilize it, and to have a bit more freedom in our society as to choosing how, how we negotiate our reality. But what now I see is that we've been at risk of replicating the same system. I see shadow banking. I see people, um, you know, opting out of systems of, of financial crime and moving into others that replicate that very, very existence. I see people that are against the financial system that have just replicated the same trading markets and the same speculative investment vehicles. I see a lot of the hopes and dreams that everybody had being essentially sidelined for the fact that we've been able to capitalize on this momentum and this movement. And then let's be fair, we've gone through such a crazy, crazy momentum. Um, like a lot has happened in these years and a lot of a lot of interesting innovations has also has sprung up and this is still very very early days but when I essentially was ready to walk away from all of this was just you know blockchain didn't end up being anything that I thought it would be I had met the Monero community and that's the only reason why I'm still in this space at all or why I think it was revived for me um, Daniel mentioned it yesterday why he likes the Monero community I'm just gonna echo a lot of his points in that sense I think it's a very First and foremost, it's not dogmatic. It's not ideological. I think the, the you know, the the ideological wars that we've seen throughout these years have, have only just gotten you know more worse. Camps are camps are camps, not because something is valid or the solution technically has a superior status, or furthermore that it is something we would even use. Um, with with Monero community, I think, and with the developers in general, and with the ID, idea is it's privacy by default. It's privacy by design. Privacy is what we're after. It doesn't necessarily matter how we get there. It's the best solution put forward, the best technically and scientifically sound solution wins. And I think that's something that we can all stand to gain from, but it is something that also is furthering and advancing this movement in this, in this technology in general. So that first and foremost to me was my, my sounding board. But then actually getting to know the community, getting to know how people interact with and care about their opinions and work with each other, I think that's something that is also um, a part of the open source movement in general and not necessarily only adherent to Monero, but it's something that I think has been been a part of this for me. So lack of ideology, the scientific and technical approach, that's all been great. I've also seen how Monero has been played out in the political landscape. I've seen how it's been played out in the, the journalist narratives. I've seen how it's also been opposed in many factions. And that's what essentially I want to talk about. So we have built a system that's technically and scientifically sound and superior for guarding our privacy. When it comes down to it, this is, the, this is how we should be building all technologies. We have our finances to consider, we have our, you know, we just had a talk on messaging, we have our communications, we have our, um, our social media. I mean, everything that we've, we've been building, no one's necessarily come at it from a privacy perspective. And I think that is just privacy by design, the, the just inherent choices that are being made there is, is a good straightforward way to start. But secondly is we're up against a system that has no desire for privacy to be included in development. We have, they have no, um, you know, no real need for that to happen because if it does happen, it breaks all of the business models that every single technology firm has pretty much predicated their entire existence upon. So really what we're up against is how do we create a narrative and how do we come up with something as a community for pro-privacy developers that are up against kind of the essential surveillance machine that honestly we're not necessarily equipped to deal with, but how do we fight that? Because what I've seen in Nero is something really interesting as well, is it's become plagued as the same, we've inherited the same narratives from, from military and industrialization on fear. It's the criminals that are going to use this, that are using this. This is what will be used for, you know, all of the, the dark net, all of the, the illicit activities that are going on in the world. Anybody that needs to hide something will be utilizing this technology rather than anybody that needs to actually preserve or wants to preserve their right as a human being, their fundamental human right to privacy is utilizing a so solution that is the best that there is for them. And I think that's something that you know, to, to, start, to start constructing around or start talking about is what we need to, we need to do. Um, in that sense, we have 
we are at, right now at a very, very interesting point in development because we're starting to define the terms and negotiate the terms of not only our next generation of technology, but of just how society is going to function into work. So when we're talking about financial privacy, or when we're talking about just our financial transactions on a general level, if I'm able to see into my friend's bank account, into my neighbor's bank account, obviously that's a problem. If furthermore, my regulators are able to understand exactly what my spending habits and my patterns have been and decide that I can be included or not included in a certain process, that's another quite big problem. I think there's a, there's a war happening right now with know your customer and any money laundering, so KYC and AML practices within the crypto space. And we're, we're not seeing necessarily an argument that says how do we use the technologies, for example, a function of Monero, the view key, to be able to identify someone's transactions, whether they've been involved in money laundering or furthermore to use a know your customer policy. It's not a matter of looking at it that way. Instead, it's saying how do we essentially see everything that is happening. And we built transparent blockchains, you know, Bitcoin, the metadata associated with it does allow for everybody to be able to track and trace all the financial tra transactions of each individual down to, the, down to the core. I grew up beside my company that I have in, in Copenhagen, grew up beside Chainalysis. I saw them go, go from seven people to 300. I saw the contracts they were bringing in. I saw exactly how this was changing and what is happening when we start to analyze the metadata involved in our blockchains and furthermore in our financial activity. The first customers aren't necessarily banks, which was a nice narrative again to spin. It was every, in, every body with three letter words that are able to track and trace and surveil. And when we're talking about surveillance capitalism, that's one thing. When we're talking about surveillance technologies, and when we actually start to discuss whether or not we are going to be able to actually exist as human beings in this world in the next stage of our technological development, in the next stage of our developmental era, I think this is something that we need to start bringing forward as a discussion. Just privacy in general, of course, but also negotiating the terms in which we develop. And I think that's important for when we talk about, for example, KYC. We're not talking any longer about KYC. We're now talking in AML. We're now talking about completely opening up all of the doors of technology and all of the windows into all of our wallets, into our financial and our personal data, and to be regulating upon full and utter transparency. We have made these technologies, men, men, and, women, men and women create them, men and women can control them, but what's happening is that rather than having these discussions as to how much is too much transparency, you know, what is just decentralization, when is it needed, when isn't it needed? or how do we actually progressively create a new regulatory regime or new policies or new financial um, regulations that are in place that deal with this entirely new breed of technology at hand. We're missing that conversation and I think that's something that's not only important to start discussing or just to even open up as something that we need to to begin negotiating together, but I think it's important to also discuss you know, how do we do that how do we as a community of people that just in general want to protect our privacy, but beyond protecting our privacy, are going to have to start answering these very fundamental questions? So how do we do that and, and how are we going to be able to, to step forward? In, in that sense, we have not only a right to privacy, a fundamental right to human rights, not everybody is granted human rights, not everybody gets human rights. The way to be able to, you know, not every state is going to necessarily implement human rights or observe them. But the right to rights essentially is, you know, a philosophy on, on how we as citizens participate and engage within the environment and the realm that we want to participate in. So if we, if we are going to start beginning discussions on, you know, I have a fundamental right to privacy, well, I have to also be able to build that solution and system. And I've seen that with Monero, I've seen that with the community. They're taking the steps to building that themselves, but now what's, I think, the next stage is how do we involve a greater discussion in society and how do we involve the multidisciplinary and kind of the cross, um, cross domain. We need, we need people in policy, such as myself. We need people that are willing to come in and just get their hands dirty and start talking about how, it, you know, how this affects them as individuals. I'm from a very, very small town in Canada and I can go home and say, you know, I'm, I'm going to do a talk on, on financial privacy in a conference soon and, and my, my grandma will say, oh, you know, I, I just talked to the Visa credit card people the other day and they knew how much was in my personal bank account and told me exactly how much I should give them per month in a payment? Why is my bank account attached to my credit card? How do they see that information? 
So that's already starting to happen in the old school regime. We're now getting into a new era where we're going to be able to essentially, and I think, Daniel, when you said it well yesterday as well, keep bringing this back to you, but we have the technology that is based on you know, chain analytics. We have data scientists. We have the ability to be able to see what's happening with people's financial data and with people's data in general that is going to be put into the hands of the few. The concentrated powers that we are fighting against are essentially now coming into this space, are monopolizing, are regulating, are creating the policies. And furthermore, beyond policy and regulation and compliance, are the ones that are going to be determining how and when we use this technology unless we're able to start countering that, unless we're able to bring forward a counter narrative that is fighting for not only our rights, but also being a part of those discussion as to what our rights are. And on, on that last note, I think it's really important to, to start naming it, to start understanding what it is that we're after and what it is that we're against. Um, I think it's unprecedented. We haven't seen this before. We don't necessarily know where it's coming from and we don't, it's, it's something that has been done in the shadows. I think one thing that I've seen as well within the community is that, and uh, within Monero, is people are okay. In a counter movement, what hap tends to happen is you hide. Because you are now a part of something that is deemed, you know, an outsider or outside of the scope of what we are allowed to do, or furthermore, in this case, has been plagued with a narrative of criminality and of you know, only those that are, are um, trying to do illicit activities are utilizing that, that people are starting to accept as a means of adaptation to hide from what we are doing or what they're doing and to hide and, and not bring this out into the open. And I think we need to name it, we need to understand it, we need to call it out and we need to do this in the open because adaptation in the name of hiding is going to risk us just being, just allowing this to happen and furthermore to be obsolete in the future. I think we need new forms of collective action from the ground up, and I think that is something that is easy to talk to most people about, whether they're technologically minded or not. I think there's um, a great ways to open up not only the discussions on privacy, on the technology that we'll utilize in the future, but just on a general level of discussion that we need to bring forward. And I think one important aspect, and I'll end it on this, is we need to start creating the solutions that work for us. That's already hard happening, okay, so we have the I think in many respects the infrastructure is starting to be built and the infrastructure is incredibly important. It's incredibly important that it's being designed in this case in, in Monero with financial, the financial infrastructure that it's being designed with privacy by default. That from the very beginning you will be protected and your privacy is, is, is um, a part of the solution. So that's, that's the great. Okay, now, now what? Now when we actually implement it, when we use it, how do we build the pipes to that infrastructure? How do we ensure that we're able to actually transact with this currency in a real world setting? How are we building solutions in even a business environment? And how are we also being able to deploy it in situations that it makes sense or furthermore build solutions, whether they're compliance solutions or new policy that it deals with our new systems that we're building, whether they're payment gateways, whether it's just even transacting or messaging within each other. We need to build these solutions from the ground up ourselves, and then we need to be able to open them up to the public. And I think that's something that when we do that and when we approach it in that way and we do that in a constructive manner, it's going to be a lot more easy to tackle, but it's also, of course, providing us a, a target. So on a last note, um, rather than just adapting to the systems that are being thrusted upon us, and rather than also hiding in the shadows and, and using this because it works for us as individuals and we're okay with that, I think we can take a note from, from what, you know, just in general what Monero has done, and, that's, and that is very concretely that against everybody, I think this is something that I wanted to, to bring up too. I saw, you know, at Monero's five-year anniversary, five-year birthday, um, Fluffy Pony said it. He said, someone said, what would you do differently if you could in all the years that you've been working at Monero? And he said, I would have prepared people, us, for the fact that we thought we were going to be heroes fighting for people's privacy. We weren't. Everybody hates us. Everybody hated us. It's turning out to be something that psychologically, emotionally, we had to prepare ourselves for that I would have gone back and prepared people for because fighting for privacy isn't necessarily the best or the, the most um, popular movement these days. And I think that is a scary notion to think about. But on the other hand, we are the ones that are starting to define this. We are the ones that have the ability to be able to step up and to also define this for the future. And if we opt out, what are we opting into? And that's a big question. And I think there are these, these 
steps that are being taken, and I think Monero is one of them, and there are several other examples in different factions that we can utilize to say, okay, this is what I cho choose to use, this is how I choose to, to also interact, but furthermore, take more steps together. We have so many different resources that we can utilize, and there's a lot of different roles that we can play. I recognize my own role isn't necessarily going to be to build these systems, but it's also going to be to implement them. It's going to be to stand on stage and talk about them. It's going to be to help to develop the policies that support them. Um, and I think essentially that's that's really all I needed to, or what I wanted to talk about today. It's, it's a, um, a historical context of, of seeing this rise and fall within an ideal that we thought we were building that I don't think is necessarily achieved within this space. I think it's the revival of Monero or the revival of just those that are actually fighting, that are taking away their private time to fight for a space in the open for other people to be able to have privacy. And I think there's a lot to be learned about that sacrifice, but also about that fight for the citizenship that we need to have in the digital era. And in order to have these rights, we need to fight for these rights. It's not just going to be handed to us. It's not going to be given to us. If the trajectory of technology, as it's already been, is going to keep going the way it is, then ultimately it's just going to be sit sit down and take it or fight for it in a way that I think we all can have. We have the skills and we have the abilities to do. So that's that. And I want everybody to have a great night. If you have any questions, I am willing to take them. You can discuss all night as well. I'll have a beer with you after. But that's my piece. <laughs> Questions? 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 Nope. Okay. Oh, there, there, there. Oh. Every time. Doesn't never step. Never fails. And thank you very much for this uh, really refreshing approach, and especially because you take all of these uh, words uh, on stage, like privacy and uh, also like your approach is, I think, what is like uh, the best in a speech. And I would love to invite you to the events that we organize because we think. Uh, this mindset has to be multiplied and uh, the question is about like um, have you experienced uh, collaboration with this uh, bigger corporations with this mindset with this kind of approach or are they still like having okay we take extract the best out of it but we are doing the closed chain approach and we we do it like you said we place privacy afterwards on top of it just to reiterate, is the question on is collaboration? Yes, collaboration. If you have experienced collaboration like with this bigger corporations in any positive way, it's like anything that you could share. Yeah, I think, I think that's incredibly important in, in many respects. Not only is it important because on a technical level, I think integration with several different systems is going to be an absolute requirement going forward. I think integration amongst any project or any system that has put privacy first and privacy by design as the fundamental pillars of how they've built these systems is something that I would utilize and could only benefit from if it were actually interoperable with other systems. So I think on a technical level, absolutely. I think on another level, we have, I think that's something that's, um, you can start to see it in the cluster. I saw it last year to this year, how much it's grown as well with just having privacy focus and privacy oriented themes um, as a part of the, the cluster itself. And you see that collaboration naturally emerge. One of the discussions that had been taken place is also what are our principles? Because putting those principles out there allow us to be able to identify like-minded people, projects, and, and collaborators. Um, so if the question is, do I believe in collaboration? Yes. I built my entire company predicated on that notion. Um, not only collaboration on a technical level and worked with you know, every project out there and anything that works we use, but also in industry or in, in general settings as well, because we're all faced with this problem. Every single one of us are faced with this challenge, whether they realize it or want to fight for it or not. So there's no sense in, in any separation in that fight. Um, it's only going to get harder and it's only going to be a bigger challenge as we go along and go forward. So it's absolutely necessary that we collaborate because if we're after the same thing, there's no reason why we don't do it together. Hi. So, sorry if I sound a little contrarian, but I think us, the crypto environment, the crypto community, we need to be ready 
like at a moment's notice to onboard a billion people. Okay, because the other system is failing by itself. We don't have to do anything. I mean, if you look around here, each and every one of you has more money than the United States government. They're like almost two trillion in debt, right? So we need to be ready to onboard a billion people, maybe two billion people in the next five to 10 years. I think that's a direction maybe more people need to think, how are we gonna do that? That's all. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one, I like that perspective. It's not a battle, it's coming to us, he says. And I think that's true, build it and they will come. I think that's something that's um, the long-term approach that is taken by by these that pe my peers that I'm able to to see to build this is I think the most important part of this is if it exists there will be a wave there will be the people that are coming towards us whether we see it or not I think it's not necessarily that um, that this it's, it's a big war I think there's going to be a migration because ultimately we're defining what new technology for the next era looks like. But how do we bring on that many people? That's the question. Scalability has been the biggest challenge in blockchain or in general with distributed and, de and decentralized systems. How do you scale something on that level when you've distributed it across the entire globe? So I think that's gonna be, of course, the biggest challenge. And it's not just technical scalability either. How do you communicate this technology? We're talking about people having wallets inside of their phones and having to transact with each other or having to utilize something that they have no clue how to use. I see that all the time, just explaining the technology and communicating itself and also creating, we need UX and UI in this space entirely and in general um, towards this, but, but how do we communicate and how do we onboard the users is gonna be a huge, huge element to all of this too. You've seen, you know, what are keys? If I lose my key, I lose my money, I don't get that. I have to write something down, I have to have cold storage. And it's just, there's a lot there that needs to be worked through before we're even close to being able to bring on that scalability. Oh, Ooh. now it's on. Uh, you, when you were talking about collaboration, I was wondering, have you heard of Daniel Schmattenberger? Sorry, I can't hear you. Are too. you familiar with Daniel Schmattenberger? No. Gener generator functions of existential risk. It's like a podcast he's done. He basically resolves that all the kind of global problems like AI or you can reduce it down to unless we evolve to only accept win-win interactions whereas current capitalism is fundamentally based on win-lose interactions unless we transition to only doing win-win interactions it's all fucked oh, i like that i wrote my master's thesis on existential risks um haven't heard that before but i think that's a very good point as well it, 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 it not just a point but that it is if we have a decision we are we're faced with shit or shit right now we're faced with giving up our rights over here or taking this other system it's a glass house with no exit and if we build the technology with a win-win in mind or furthermore our solutions with that in place, then really you only have, yeah, the best outcome either way. So it doesn't matter what camp you're in or it doesn't matter what you choose and collaboration becomes an inherent form of it. That's a, yeah, I like that. Thank you. Good, solid. Uh, my question is, what are your thoughts about the non-privacy aspects of Monero? Yeah, I like what you did there. Um, actually, that for me was my, without having known anybody or even really been close to uh, the movement at all or within Monero, I think that was the only thing that I knew and I think that's what everybody's faced with as well. And the non-privacy experts of Monero then essentially are those that are utilizing, I'm assuming you're going in this direction, um, the technology to obfuscate, to be able to, um, yeah, to illicitly move around or furthermore, there's a lot of use of this technology that is, is very detrimental. And I think that will naturally happen and it has happened. The first adopters of every technology that we've made has like the first and most innovative adopters have been criminals. And I think that's something that is just naturally gonna happen. But what to me is interesting in this as well with even Monero, like this is such a small percentage of the criminal activity that goes on in our day-to-day -day world. Like we have been faced with 
even let's just take the financial sector for a second as a sector in general and what they got away with my I bring it back to small town because you can my uncle is retiring and he's going to be getting six thousand five hundred dollars a year in his pension even though he's paid into pension his entire life because they gambled it away and there was no laws protecting him so what do I think about the non-privacy users of, or non-privacy oriented users of Monero? I think they exist everywhere and I think that any system that exists they'll be utilized for bad but and, and beyond that, um, without this type of system, there's no way to protect the good users as well. And I think that's something that's very important here because if we continue to have the narrative that is driven solely by and inherited from the industrial complex or from the military complex that is driven by fear and that is driven by the fact that criminals use this, then we are going to be put into a place where we're accepting what is offered to us and we're accepting technology that is essentially, or solutions in general, that essentially exploit us and take away our rights. So I think that they are the reason why we have to fight because they're gonna be what's used as the emblem of what it is that, you know, why Monero shouldn't succeed or why privacy-oriented technology shouldn't succeed. So that's the biggest uh, narrative that we need to counter for sure. Great, is that? And now, officially, I'll let uh, Diego end the night. <laughs> Thank you very much. Let's give her a hand. Thank you, Diana. I, I really wish I had the humility to give off the same kind of vibes. You know, this is a this is a conversation. I'm not talking at you. We're talking with each other. But I enjoy the spotlight too much for that. So I am talking at you guys. And what I'm saying right now is that we are at the end of today. So you are all free to go do as you please. Go explore the rest of C3. For those of you that you just can't get enough of our content, I know we are keeping you from the rest of this entire conference. I release you now. You can go. You can see everything else it has to offer, all that slightly inferior co uh, content out there. You can go check all of that out now. Um, we will be back tomorrow with a lot more things. Go to decentral.community to see uh, what we've got lined up for tomorrow. we got a lot of great talks. we got more workshops coming on. So I hope you guys come back and I hope you enjoyed what we got today. I want to give a great big thanks to the audio team, to the team that's providing the stream for those that could not be with us here today. Um, and to all of our speakers that spoke today, can we give them a quick round of applause? Uh, just everybody, thank you so much for all of your hard work. We will see you guys tomorrow, bright and early.